And so, ladies and gentlemen, as we turn to the Word of God once again, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, as I preach once again in your hearing the story of the Gentile general, the story of the gentle Gentile general, part 6. Uh, of the Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign, day 597, on our way to a thousand uh, during this uh, era uh, since January the 20th, 2017, day 964, since January the 1st, 2016. Matthew chapter 8 verse 5 and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying Lord my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy grievously tormented And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Do you have that kind of faith? this morning about your situation you may have a child that needs to be healed you might have a spouse that needs to be healed you might have a mother who can't remember your name or a father who is shaking like a leaf in the wind because of Parkinson's you might need healing and some of you need healing and you don't even know it and you so you better pray for preemptive healing if you will but you got to have faith you got to have faith uh, George Michael was right about a couple of things but he was wrong about so much else uh, he was right in his songs and singing, you got to have faith. But he was wrong about many other things in his life and messed up about many things in his life and died a sad, pitiful death. But you got to have faith, folks, if you want to see God hear and answer your prayers. For I am a man under authority, he said, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Goeth, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you for your holy word. 
We praise you and we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. Is there a problem here? Okay, let's finish and wrap it up. Leave it. And Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you for your Holy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we preach. We thank you for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your Holy Word. We thank you, Lord, for that strange and interesting thing that you do through the foolishness, the foolishness of preaching. No one can explain it. It is the most powerful form of communication known to mankind. It's more powerful than television. It's more powerful than radio. It's more powerful than what we can do on the Internet. It's the most powerful form of communication on earth. It's more powerful than writing. It's more powerful than singing. The foolishness, what uh, some call the foolishness of preaching, what Paul talked about in your Holy Word. And so, Lord, it is so sad that so many of us who have truly been called have forsaken, uh, forsaken the preaching of your Holy Word for skits, for plays, for video, for singing, and so many other things. These things, I'm sure, have their place, but they cannot replace the preaching of your Holy Word and the precious preaching of the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It may seem old-fashioned. It may seem outdated. It may seem out of place in our society. But as one preacher, a liberal preacher, said, if there ever was a time to preach, that time is now. And so, Lord, we thank you for the power of preaching. The greatest, most powerful form of communication in the history of the world. Lord, we cannot explain it, but we thank you for it. And we thank you for how you use it in the lives of lost people and saints. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. We pray for over three million souls to be saved, three million Christians to be revived through the preaching of your holy word. In your holy name glorified, Jesus Christ sitting at your right hand, uh, lifted up, and Satan always horrified at the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and of his shed blood. For it is in his name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, after Jesus expresses his admiration, his marveling for the great faith shown by the Roman centurion, in contrast to the lack of faith among many of his Jewish followers coming down the mountain and certainly the religious leaders of the day Jesus issues these parting words go thy way and as thou hast believed so be it done unto thee he confirms the faith of the gentle Gentile general the centurion and expresses that his request will be granted according according to the measure of his faith according to the measure of his faith isn't that how it is for us today as well according to your faith so it be uh, so be it unto you. And Dr. Adam Clark said, According to thy faith, be it done unto thee, is a general measure 
of God's dealings with mankind. God is all about us having faith in Him. He is big on that. Jesus is too, and they are uh, very uh, concerned, if you will, when you don't show faith in God, when you don't show faith in Jesus Christ. That's a problem in their hearts and minds, if you will. Uh, Nothing bothers them more than a lack of faith. And one of the reasons is because God knows, Jesus knows, it is your wicked, evil, sinful heart that makes you that way. Full of unbelief. I told somebody some time ago that you can do great things for God and God can use you mightily but what will destroy you every time, what will stop you every time is your wicked, evil, sinful heart. That is what's going to tear you down. That's what's going to destroy you. That's what's going to stop you. You have the talent. You have the ability. Just like God gives talent and ability to everybody. But because you're unfaithful, because you're disobedient, because you're full of sin and wickedness, uh, your life will come to naught and you will end up a loser and a failure in life if you don't confess your sins and repent. And I say that to everybody. Because that will block you from having faith in God. Nothing will block you from having true faith in God like your dark, wicked, evil heart. That's why God hates it, this unbelief. That's why Jesus despises this unbelief and even showed how showed some upsetness, if you will, at people who did not believe. He would say such things as, ye who are so slow to believe, O ye of little faith. Kind of like almost he was exasperated with the, the wickedness and evil in people's hearts. They were so dark and wicked. That they can't even see that God is standing right in front of them. So blind. So Dr. Adams goes on to say to get an increase of faith is to get an increase of every grace which constitutes the mind that was in Jesus. And prepares fully for the enjoyment of the kingdom of God. God is the same in the present time which he was in ancient times and miracles may be wrought for us by the instrumentality the instrumentality of our faith but alas where is faith to be found today End of quote. Jesus found great faith in the centurion. More so than all of the thousands of Israelites that were following him down the mountain after the most exciting, most profound, most powerful message ever preached. Millions of messages have been preached from that sermon Because it is the most profound message ever preached by any man. And certainly, uh, this was the man Christ Jesus. So, beloved, Jesus found great faith in the gentle Gentile general. We call him gentle because he he was extraordinary. A war... A man of war, a man of fighting, which my baby son would love, Uh, but uh, he was tender-hearted and gentle towards his slave, his servant. 
that's why we call him gentle. Jesus found great faith in the heart of this man because scripture teaches that God deals with us in accordance with our faith. And so therefore, uh, there has to be some uh, element of free moral agency in there somewhere. It is your choice to believe in God. And as I said earlier, if you choose to have a dark, wicked, evil heart that hides the ability to believe in God, to trust in Jesus, then you won't have great faith. You, some people don't have faith at all. They don't believe God can do anything to this day. People have been in the church for years. They still are doubting Thomases and doubting Thomasinas. They don't believe God can do anything. You Listen to me very carefully. You have them in your church. They sit on the same pew. It's called the doubting pew. They hang together. They're, doubt, they're, 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 they're part of the doubting club. The whole conversation is centered around doubting and, and fear and unbelief. Uh, they're not a part of the Caleb Club. They're part of the others. They're not a part of the club of Joshua. And I believe, sad to say, that there are more doubters in the church today than they are believers. I really believe that. I'm mean, it's sad to say it. That's why the church moves so slowly, so sluggishly, because we have pews filled with a bunch of drawbackers and doubters, fearful, anxious people who don't believe in God. Their hearts are so wicked and so evil and dark with fornication and adultery, lying and cheating and drugging and pornography and whoring around and having bad attitudes and hating people in the church and gossip. Foolishness. And going into debt. And so busy covering up their tracks and covering up their sins that they can't have faith in God. Some people have sinned uh, their way so far away from God, uh, they don't even know what faith is. They doubt if they can even get back to faith. They're so far gone, backslidden. That's why we pray often for God to reclaim the backslidden. That's a minute, by the way, my beloved pastors, church servant leaders, that's a ministry all by itself. If your church spent the next five years going after all of the thousands that have come through the church and left, have gone back into the wilderness, have gone back to Egypt, they made it all the way back to hitchhike, all the way back to Egypt. You can fill your church up just by getting the backslidden saints back in faith, back in church and believing in God. And they will never come if you're not praying for them first. That's the problem in the church. Most pastors don't pray for the people. They play for the people. They create all kinds of wonderful playing things for the church uh, to keep people coming back. The only problem with that is that which brought them was uh, you're going to have to keep on doing that to keep them. Those who have faith in God for great things will see those great things done. For Jesus told us not too long ago, um, Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Amen. Somebody. Have faith in God. Please note that Jesus says to the uh, gentle Gentile general be it done unto thee Jesus worked this healing miracle not only for the sake of the servant 
And by the way, I want you to notice how easy it was for Jesus. See, that which you think is hard is not hard for God. Can somebody please, if you know Jesus a little bit, uh, that which may be hard in your mind is not hard for God. Amen. Somebody please. If you know God just a little bit. Yes, you got a little faith left. Notice how easy it was. Zip, bam, boom. Your servant is healed. Don't you worry about a thing. As you go, by the time you get there, your servant will meet you at the door. Amen, somebody. <laughs> Nothing hard for God, man. That which is hard in your mind is not hard for God. Are you kidding me? No, 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 no. You need to line yourself up with God. That's the problem. You need to have faith in God. That's the problem. You need to confess your sins and repent of your sins and get your act together, get your heart right before God. And then we might get on down the road a piece and seeing God do some wonderful things in your life. I know I'm telling the truth. I know for a fact I'm telling you the truth. The. He did it for the gentle Gentile general. Basically, the gentle Gentile general was a bad man. He was a bad man in the eyes of Jesus. That means good in the Negro vernacular for you, my dear white brothers and sisters. God bless you. I can see some of my white brothers and sisters. Oh, Lord, what? He was bad? I thought he was good. Oh, well, I guess he's bad then. Yeah, he's bad in the, in the good sense, okay? All right, just calm down. Jesus worked this healing miracle not only for the sake of the servant. My God, my God, help us to believe. But primarily for the sake of the centurion who had faith that the miracle could be worked. And by the way, uh, this man has so much faith he had no doubt about it. This was almost a matter of fact for him. It was not a hope so thing. Like some of you folks. Excuse me. Got this hope so faith in the Dallas Cowboys. You hope they win. You need to switch your allegiance to the Kansas City Chiefs. With Mahone as quarterback. And have, have confidence that they will win. Or the New England Patriots. Because of the quarterback. Tom Brady. That they will win. See, we as Dallas Cowboys fans, we used to have this on the Roger Starback and on the Troy Aikman. We had confidence when we went to the stadium or when we watched the game that the Dallas Cowboys was going to win confident like the Centurion. Matter of fact, just play the game and uh, we know who's going to win. We have confidence. And, and, and if they lose, it's an anomaly. We can take one or two. But not every Sunday. Don't get me started, people. Calm down. Let me get back to the Bible. Don't get me going. Without the centurion's faith. <laughs> Brother man servant was was hurting. He was he was racked up in pain, man. <laughs> Some of you have never had pain like this. It's hard to even pray when you're in pain like this. Here's how you pray when you're in pain, when your body is racked in pain and your body is contorted. Lord, help. That's, how, that's all you can get out. Lord, help. God, heal. You can hardly get out of the word me. <laughs> oh, yes. But thank God he had a general who was gentle and concerned. The servant, without the centurion's faith, the servant would not have been healed. That's it. And not just healed, but healed in the self-same hour. Before he even got back, if he was the one who, whoever came and told Jesus this, before they got back, the servant was healed. Can somebody say amen? When Jesus told the centurion, go thy way, he commanded the servant's instantaneous healing. 
See, when God does something for you, it doesn't take long. Uh, may, God, may God help you if you're trying to get, you're trying to let the government play God. The government going to make you pay. It's going to take you a whole. It's going to take you a long time, multiple trips, multiple phone calls with people who have bad attitudes, people who act like they never heard of you before, even though you've been paying taxes for years. It's like pulling teeth. And when the government shuts you down, they shut you down. Bam. They do it in a rude way. They don't talk to you kindly. The servant going his way and returning to his house was an extension of his faith. He didn't see the servant healed, but he believed based on Jesus' word that the servant was healed. Everything was all right. And I'm sure that the centurion today had uh, in his heart that sweet confidence that many thousands, yea, probably millions of Christians have had once they have prayed about something and they prayed it through, like the old saints used to say. Praying through. Once you have prayed something through, uh, God will give you a peace. You might even keep on praying, but God will give you a peace that is done. It is done. Go your way. Whatever the situation is, it's fixed. Uh, God even tell you, today is Friday. By Monday, your situation will be fixed. Don't you worry about a thing. He'll give you peace. Oh, yes, He will. Thousands of Christians know what I'm talking about. Luke 7 tells us that by the time the centurion arrived home, he found the servant whole that had been sick. Amen, somebody. Do you have that kind of faith anymore? You used to have it. If you're a child of God, do you believe in God like that now? Do you believe in God like that now for your son, for your daughter, for your spouse, for your marriage? And see, the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, we are big on Christian couples staying together and toughing it out, if necessary, whatever, 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 toughing it out. It's because it is a testimony to a dying and lost world that God can keep Christian marriages together. You lose a big portion of your testimony when you divorce before the world. I know many uh, uh, Christians, evangelicals don't want to hear that, but it's true. It's true. And people automatically say in their minds, Christian and non-Christian, well, if... Uh, God can't keep them together. They supposed to be all this, you know, all this and all that as Christians and prayer warriors and Bible people and people who study the Bible. They go to a Bible church. They go to the Bible Baptist church every Sunday faithfully. And their marriage is shot to hell. I guess we might as well go ahead and divorce too. We don't need to go to that church. Their children are acting just as crazy as mine. In fact, they're leading my children to hell. So ladies and gentlemen, have faith for your marriage. Have faith in God, Jesus said, for your marriage. Because God hates divorce, and Jesus is against it too, by the way. We're just bringing it home for you. Don't get mad. So, well, I'm already divorced. Well, if, if, you, if you can, go back and get your husband. Go back and get your wife. Invite, invite them to dinner today if they, ha if they have not been snapped up by another devil. Excuse me. Excuse me. Don't you get mad with me. If you have not been caught up with somebody else already in a little fake 
in love situation call her up better yet send them a text better than that send them a letter saying hey listen I've been thinking let's go to lunch on Wednesday and let's talk this out we have three children hanging in the balance crying and boohooing because their father and mother are not together because they're acting like they're still in high school that's all it is a bunch of immaturity unresolved high school garbage pray to God about it have faith in God about it don't you get mad with me I don't care what your pastor said it's not good. It's going to be a bad situation all the way around for you and your children. It does not work out, my dear friend, because it is contrary to God's will. Have faith for your marriage. We got these people who've got faith for everything in the world but their own marriage. What, 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 what? What are you talking about? I can't hear you. They got faith for everybody else's family, but they don't have faith for their own marriage and family. I'm talking about pastors of the church. They got faith for everybody else's situation, laying their little demonic hands on everybody else, but they have not laid hands on their husband or their wife, or they laid hands on them in the wrong way, and they have not laid hands on their own children, but want to lay their hands on everybody else's children. And wicked, evil, ungodly people in the church like to have it so. The pastor's family is a mess, and mine is too, so let's go to the Mess Baptist Church and create some more mess by getting involved with the singles group with half the members who have been divorced on the hunt for precious little single lives to mess up and to mess over. And the pastor and the pastor's wife and the elders of the church are responsible for this evil that's going on. And God is not pleased. And you wonder why judgment is coming upon America? In the words of Billy Graham, we are tolerating things we used to not tolerate. So have faith in God, my beloved, like this centurion. Have faith for your own marriage. Have faith for your own children. And by the way, before you try to reach somebody else, reach your own family. Amen, somebody. Amen, lights. And we have a whole lot of lights in here this morning. I don't know where they came from, but we thank God for them. Amen, lights. Before you have all of this faith for somebody else's family and you want to help somebody else's family and you look so disgusting when you shake your head at somebody else's family falling apart and your family is a sham. Nothing but phoniness. Hypocrisy. Dr. Russell Moore calls it the prosperity, the prosperity family. <laughs> the prosperity gospel family. Are you kidding me? Got all this faith for great things and great mission work and traveling around the world and your family is shot to hell. Charity begins at home, dear friend. Don't get don't you get mad with me. Don't you get mad with me. I preach every day. So I'll never listen to you again. That's, that's all right. I got you today. God will send somebody else to replace you tomorrow. You say, you won't get my offering. You won't get any money from me. I know you need some money. You won't get any money from me. I've been preaching for 40 years without your money. I'll keep on preaching. Amen, somebody. I'll tell you what, you'll never preach in my church. I don't want to preach in your church because if I joined your church, I would have to uh, backslide to get into fellowship. At your little ice cream social. Your little twister games. Your little playgrounds. 
your coffee shop in the church. Are you kidding me? I would have the backslide to get into fellowship. So my beloved, that is the challenge for us today. To have great faith in God. And God has led me to explain to you very clearly some trash you've got to get out of your life before you can have this great faith. To believe the words of God, to believe the words of Jesus, and to go our way. Amen, somebody. To go about our day today lives, to live our lives believing that God will do as He promised. Because He will. But in the words of one great prayer warrior who helped build a university for the glory of God, we're not on praying ground. <laughs> we're, not to mention we're not on uh, a prayer answering ground. We're not even on praying ground with sin in our lives. Hatred towards our wives. Disrespect towards our husbands. Children out of control and running over the parents. Committing atrocities at school. Are you kidding me? We need to confess our sins, dear friends. We need to repent. We need to get our hearts right with God and we all know it. Erdman Neumeister said, I know my faith is founded on Jesus Christ by God and Lord. And this my faith confessing. Unmoved I stand upon his word. Man's reason cannot fathom the truth of God profound who trusts her subtle wisdom relies on shifting ground God's word is all sufficient it makes divinely sure in trusting in its wisdom my beloved my faith shall rest secure and the church said Amen let's all stand for prayer Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you for your Holy Word, your Holy Spirit. Holy Father God, for your love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, it starts all with you, your amazing love, uh, your phenomenal love, Lord, the love that we can't get our little brains and heads around, we just can't. Thank you for your love this morning. I feel it. Uh, and Lord, I thank you for it. And I thank you for your Holy Spirit, your Holy Word. And thank you, Lord, for everyone here who helps make this possible, preaching the gospel around the world. We thank you for the crowds that you draw, Lord, each and every message. Lord, they come only for you. They come, Lord, for your holy word. They love still the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of your holy word. The simple, plain foolishness of preaching. Lord, they just love it. And we love them for standing with us, with their prayers, with their amens, with their hearts, with their likes with their comments, with their prayer requests. Thank you, Lord, for the thousands who have come down through the years. And we're praying for over three million souls to come to know your Savior, three million Christians to be revived, and your holy name glorified. And Lord, save them today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Lord, help us as Christians to have faith in you. Amen. You may be seated, my beloved, in the presence of of the Lord. Now, dear friend, if you are with us today and you do not know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior in the free pardon of your sins, allow me to show you how you can place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save your soul from the power of sin and uh, 
the punishment of sin, which is eternal hell. I mention that in every message because most preachers don't say anything like it. They don't say anything about it, rather. So first, accept the fact, dear friend, that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's laws. This is the bad news. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm going to get to the good news, but you need to hear the bad news so that you can appreciate the good news. We're sinners. We have failed. You know we are. We all are. We have nasty habits. Nasty deeds. Evil things that we think, say, and do that disgust God. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. That's still in the Bible. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then secondly, because we have fallen short, because we're sinners, accept the fact that there is a penalty for sin. Always. Is that way in your house? In your family? Is that way down at the police station? Is that way in the courtroom? Is that way at school or it should be? There's a punishment for sin, for the Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. We die physically because of sin. Every last one of us will die. I know you don't believe it, but you will believe it when you die. And you don't know when you're going to die. You might die like the 18-year-old beautiful young lady who is just starting life as a freshman at a Christian college. Shot, trampled over, and killed on a night out just having fun, as so many of us have done. But she's gone. She's dead at 18. They'll be burying her in a few days. And you can die today. I don't care how old you are. Whether you're black or white or red or yellow, you can die today or you can die tomorrow. The day of your death may be tonight. Stop playing games. And when you die, your body will be buried into a grave. That beautiful young lady will be six feet under in a few days, in a day or two. Her life is over. There's nothing you can do but bury them or cremate them. And by the way, if I were you, I would not be cremated. I would go back to the dust where I came, not tossed into the sea. But be that as it may, you will die one day and you will be buried. There's nothing else we can do with you when you're dead. Your body has got to go. But sad, but true. Your soul, if you have never trusted Christ as Savior, if, you, if you've never paused for a minute in your life to believe on Christ, will go to hell forever. So thirdly, dear friend, accept the fact that you are a sinner. And thirdly, accept the fact that you're on the road to hell for your sins if you have not trusted Christ as Savior. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able... To kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. <clears throat> hell is an awful place. Hell is a sad place. Hell is bad news. Hell is a place of pain. The nay hell is a place of darkness. Out of darkness. A place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The pain is so bad. You say, preacher, who will go to hell? Re Revelation chapter 21, 8 tells us. But the fearful will go to hell. People too afraid to get saved. Because they're, more, they're fearful of what their family members might say. Or what their friends might say. You have to forsake your family members and friends to save your soul. If you, if you have to forsake your family members and friends to get your soul saved from hell, then you need to do that. Is that important? And unbelieving. 
The unbelieving will go to hell. Those who don't believe in God, you know, the atheists, the agnostics, many scientists, those who don't believe in Christ, unbelieving, and the abominable people who commit abominable acts. Uh, they, they take sin to another level. They try to turn God's world upside down on his head. These are they, such as the homosexuals and the lesbians, the uh, people who commit abominable acts. God called their acts abominations. These are they who take sin above what is even uh, normal for human beings. These are the Abominable people who commit abominations. Man having sex with man. Woman having sex with woman. Let me help you. I hate to say it. Just in the news this past week, a man was put in jail because he was running a porn site of men and women having sex with dogs. Bestiality. Men and women having sex with animals. Uh, homosexuals who make human beings into little dogs and pets. Dressing them up like dogs and making them bark like animals. Walking around on a chain. Abominations. Stealing young women and making them into whores. Prostitutes. Abominations. The abominable crowd. They're going to hell. You ask who's going to hell? I'm telling you. Don't get mad. And murderers. Murderers. People who kill other people. The man who killed those 12 people and then was on, uh, he, he did something nobody else has ever done. With a gun in his right hand and a phone in his left hand, taking pictures and videos and putting them on Instagram, telling the world, I had no reason to do this. <clears throat> Murderers. The young black man, 22 years old. Who said that he raped this beautiful woman. And was beating her up, and she started fighting back. And all he said, he said, all he saw was red. That's what the devil shows you when you lose your mind. He just went crazy. He saw red because all he could see was blood while he was pummeling her face. Murderers and whoremongers and whores and sorcerers, people who practice voodoo and witchcraft and. Uh, Reading the lines in your hands and astrologers and all idolaters, people who put anything or anybody before God and all liars, they all will go to hell. All liars, the Bible says, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The preacher, you're going to scare the people. Where am I going to scare them to? Hell number one or hell number two? Somebody needs to tell them the truth. You want to live that kind of lifestyle? That's your choice. We're all free moral agents. You can do what you want to do. You're right. You're grown. And you're grown enough to go to hell as well. So hell in the lake of fire, that's bad news. Now with that black backdrop, you can understand the good news. And you can appreciate the good news. And here's the good news for you. And I delight in telling you the good news. Jesus Christ himself said in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever. That means black people and white people. Red people and yellow people. Homosexuals. Whoremongers. Adulterers. Adulteresses. Fornicators. Even in the church. Homosexuals, liars, cheats, everybody is included in this verse. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. 
Perish where? Perish in hell, but have everlasting life. Where? In heaven. And just believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop being fearful. Be willing to turn from your evil ways. You already know this in your heart. They want you to trust Christ as Savior. Uh, that a change must be, uh, must be wrought in your life. God will help you. You already know this. Once you trust Christ, people get all bent out of shape. Well, he must repent before he... T no, no. Just trust Christ and you will repent. <laughs> God will make sure that God will help you to repent. Uh, he, he, would, he, would, he would not have it any other way. What are you talking about? You know, instinctively you ought to repent once you, tr once you trust Christ as Savior. Everybody knows it. Just believe in your heart, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. He suffered, he bled, and he died on the cross for your sins. Was buried and rose on the third day. So that you can live forever with him. That's a beautiful thing. That's why it's good news. Particularly against the black backdrop of the bad news that I mentioned to you. Here's uh, the good news. You don't have to join a church to be saved. You don't have to be in a church to be saved. You don't have to do work in the church to be saved. You don't have to do good things to be saved. You don't have to give any money to the church or to a preacher to be saved. You don't have enough money in the world to pay for your salvation. That's why it's free. God made it very simple and easy for us. Why would he make it difficult for such wicked, evil, and ignorant people as we are? We would mess it up if, we made it if, if he made it difficult. So pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to save your soul. Believe in your heart that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. Here's God's guarantee. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 13. That if thou, you, shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou, you, shall be saved. Saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Not saved to religion. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from the punishment of sin. Saved from the power of sin. Saved from eternal damnation. If you want to be saved right now, some of you are gathered around television sets in India. Uh, some of you uh, are gathered around computers. Uh, in uh, Kenya, Nigeria, France, all around the world. And we thank God for you. You can be saved today, right where you are. Believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. Pray and ask him to save your soul, and he will. Repeat after me. I'll help you with the prayer. Repeat after me, phrase by phrase, and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I have done evil in your sight by breaking your Ten Commandments. I admit that I have lied many times. I admit that I have uh, stolen things that were not mine. I admit that I have lusted after people and things. I have coveted after other people's things. I admit that I've taken your holy name in vain. I admit that I've dishonored and disrespected my parents at times. I have broken your Ten Commandments, therefore. And I understand that I deserve to go to hell. Please have mercy and grace upon me for Jesus Christ's sake. As I now believe the best way that I know how in the Lord Jesus Christ. That he died for my sins. He suffered. He bled. And he died on the cross for my sins. To pay my sin debt that I owe. 
that he was buried and that he rose on the third day. And he's sitting at your right hand right now. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul and change my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to truly repent of my sins past and to turn from my evil ways and to follow you in the new life forever. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake. Thank you for saving my soul. Amen. Now dear friend of mine, if you believed in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins, paid your sin debt, was buried, and rose again, he is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, John the Baptist told us, all of our sins are paid for under the blood of Jesus and gone once we trust Christ as Savior. Allow, and you pray that prayer with me and you meant it from your heart. Allow me to say congratulations on doing the most important thing in life. And that is trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to GospelLightSociety.com or stay there at Gospel Lighthouse of Prayer if you're there or wherever you might be.